In this tutorial, we're going to go over Lab Report 1 for KNH382 Lab. So, this one's going to be due on a Sunday at 11.59 p.m. For this particular class, it's due on February 26, 2023, so make sure you check to make sure when yours is exactly due. There's a limit of 20 pages on the Lab Report. That's mainly because it shouldn't take you that much. And if you write any more, you're not 100% sure what you're saying. You're just typically writing a little bit more than you need. Uh, beyond what the what the question is asking, which makes it hard for us to grade because then we have to kind of search for the answer within a sea of words, so to speak. So make sure you, if you really do need 20, more than 20 pages, uh, you contact myself or the instructor and get approval for that. Otherwise, we're not going to grade it. Our, we're, it's not worth our time, so to speak. So opening up Law Report 1, I got, have that open here on the right. So it's set as a Google Doc that opens up. What we want you to do, you can't edit this format. You can see that I can edit it because I'm, it's my document. But we want you to go to File, Make a Copy. And making a copy, that's going to be your copy that you'll be able to edit and do things with. So go ahead and write your name, write my name or your lab instructor, whoever that may be. and going through this, we'll have you complete and submit this document with everything, all the answers, all that sort of stuff on here. Don't write it on a separate document and transfer it. That's just more trouble than it's worth. For, for you, it's going to be hard to keep things straight for you. I've had people that try to write paragraphs answering these questions and it was hard to keep things organized. And then also, it's going to be easier for myself or the lab instructor to grade because they'll be able to just take a look right through everything and have to and be able to make a judgment on the answers and all of that. Uh, so it's going to be a win-win for you and don't make it harder on yourself than it uh, can be. Another thing, do not add any additional letters or numbers to this already made list. Mm, I'll go over that here in just a second. So, first question, introduction and purpose. We got write a paragraph overview of the lab activities performed during weeks one and two. So weeks one and two, we did the uh, blood pressure and heart rate at rest and during exercise. Then week two, we did blood lipids, we did a little body comp with BMI and waist circumference, height and weight, and then also did uh, the risk calculators and the um, tracking your physical activity using a pedometer or some type of other wearable. So just write paragraph. Paragraph for me is about five to seven sentences, so that's all you need to keep it at. Not a paragraph for both weeks, just a paragraph overall, one paragraph. Um, it's just an overview. It's not a super detailed list. So to do that, all you'll do is just add a space here. I use my enter or your return key, add another, and you can just go ahead and start writing in here. During weeks one and two, and so on. You just write the answer on in there. Then, getting to the purpose of the, say, stating the purpose of the entire class and your data. So that's more or less two sentences I'm looking for there. So, purpose of gathering your data. This is going to be related to coronary heart disease risk. You're going to have to put it in a little bit more words than just that. But, uh, all those things that we took take a look at regarding blood pressure and also um, the other risk factors that's all related to coronary heart disease risk. So that's for your data. For the entire class, however, it's going to be a little bit different. We're not taking a look at risk factors uh, in terms of coronary heart disease risk for each individual person. We're taking a look at the relationship of those variables within a larger sample, larger sample being the entire class. Uh, so we'll be taking a look at things like uh, like physical activity and blood pressure, physical activity and blood lipid values and also blood glucose values. So we're looking at those relationships for the most part in there. So make sure you write a little bit about those. Again, it's a statement of purpose uh, for the data and, your, and the in data from the entire class. That's more or less just should be only two sentences, not that much. I'm not asking you to write paragraphs, okay? <laughs> so, 
B, coronary disease risk assessment and classification data interpretation. So attach the following completed forms from week one module. Descriptions are not acceptable. So we got these two forms here. Let me go to week one over here. So week one, we have our Part Q Plus and our ACSM files. Download them, complete them, and you can either screenshot and paste the screenshots in here, or you can just go ahead when you turn this document itself in, just attach as well these completed forms. You can attach PDFs during uh, when you actually submit the uh, submit things. PDF right here. These are the file types that are acceptable. So, part two, include the blood pressure tables from week one data recording form. For that, all it's asking you is to copy and paste those blood pressure tables into this document and then answer those questions. You can just add a space here and put both of those in right here. That's it. So, question A, sub question A. Was there a lot of variability in blood pressure and heart rate measurements? So you'll have to take a look at your data, look at the standard deviation around that average to see, to determine if there is a lot of variability in blood pressure and heart rate measurements. And then, and just make a, make a sentence or two about that. So B, does your resting systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure classify you as being at risk for coronary heart disease risk? So. Looking at resting blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, does it make you at risk? Just make a statement or two, paragraph, uh, not paragraph, sorry, a sentence or two about that and make sure it's a complete sentence. Don't just say yes or no. We want you to actually demonstrate that you know what you're talking about in terms of because, like, like an example, because my blood pressure was below 130, I am not at, uh, my systolic blood pressure was below 130, I am not at risk of coronary heart disease or diastolic blood pressure if it's below 80 or something to that effect but make sure it's a complete sentence that demonstrates what the classification is and what your blood pressure is or your blood pressure does not reach that threshold that sort of thing okay what is the expected physiological change in systolic and diastolic blood pressure when we increase exercise intensity so make sure you describe what that should be Again, a sentence or two. And then, did your exercise and recovery systolic blood pressure respond? So this is now relating the first part to your data. Did it respond as expected? And if not, why? Could be due to a number of reasons. Then part D, what are some possible sources of air when measuring blood pressure from a technician and subject perspective? So things that could go wrong from a technician's end, what could they do wrong? and what could a subject do wrong and make sure you include at least two for each two for the technician two for the subject what can the subject do wrong or improperly uh, what can the technician do improperly and then three include the obesity data table from week two data recording form and write whether your data would classify you as being at risk for coronary heart disease so just copy and paste that in and then write a sentence or two about all of those things total cholesterol LDL HDL and glucose do those based on those numbers that you got are you at risk of coronary heart disease just write whether you are past the threshold or above the threshold and you are or whatever is applicable to you but again make sure it's a full sentence that demonstrates you understand what the threshold is, where your data stands, and whether or not you're at risk. And then four, include the blood uh, lipid data table from week two data recording form and answer the following questions. So copy and paste that on in, like so. And then under what conditions do we repeat blood lipid measurements? So if, we're, uh, if measurements weren't performed properly, um, like person wasn't fasting uh, or if the person had a high level value beyond the threshold we would retest that because we want a second measurement to confirm and then based on your data would you need to repeat a measurement uh, that's just taking a look at your data and knowing 
whether or not you need to take another measurement. So, if you, uh, I don't, I usually don't retake any measurements. Um, but if you did need to retake any measurements, state the reason for for this one as well. So, do any of the data from the blood lipid table classify you as being at risk for coronary heart disease? And if so, which? So this is again just taking a look at your data versus the thresholds and writing a sentence appropriate for whether or not you're at risk for coronary heart disease. Part 5, or question 5, include the completed IPAC data table from week 2, data recording form. Copy and paste that on in, and then state the current recommendations for physical activity, and then based on that, do you meet or exceed or, or not meet the recommendations based on your data, your IPAC data. Cool. Part six, include the phone app and other wearable technology tables. So if you only did one of them, you're only expected to do, to do one of them. Copy and paste that table in. If you did both, copy and, pa copy and paste both tables in. From week two data recording form and write a summary of your data in reference to the PCPFS reading. So this is the first mention of that. Let's go to the week two module. Oh, sorry, not the week two module, the lab report one module. So question, this is sort of a bullet point for question B6. That's what we're on right here. And also it's going to come up for B9. So PCPFS, I make a hint here that you are looking for a range for adults. So make sure you use a range, uh, the correct range for young adults. That is a hint that you should be looking for. Um, if we see 10,000, we'll know you didn't read it, because uh, that's not correct. So that's giving you a heads up of it's not 10,000 already. And that's that's a point, not even a range. So 10,000 is a point, not even a range. So make sure you look for that range and use it appropriately. So describe your experience using it. So you just talk about your, your experience using it, just a couple sentences, nothing too extravagant. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the IPAC compared to the, to the wearable technologies? You just write about the advantages of the IPAC and the disadvantages of the IPAC in, in comparison to wearable technologies. You shouldn't write about the advantages or disadvantages of, wearable tech, of the wearable technologies themselves. You're only speaking of the IPAC to wearable technologies. Now the disadvantages of the IPAC could be advantages of wearable technology, but Again, just state it in reference to disadvantages of the IPAC to that. Then, provide some reasons for differences in overall physical activity between the IPAC and phone app data or other wearable technologies. So just write a couple sentences about this, about these things. Do you think the phone app or other wearable physical activity monitoring technology is a reliable method of tracking physical activity? Generally, your answer should be yes and provide some reasons for it. There could be some instances where some type of device would not be a very good method for, for someone in particular, but if you, you're going down that route, you have to be very specific and show and tell why that wouldn't work. But generally, your answer is going to be yes. Just sort of a hint there. So, what are some of the limitations to each measurement technique and talk about these things, phone app and IPAC. Where can they fail or where are they limited in their ability to measure? That's all you got to talk about. A couple sentences about each. All right, part seven, include the coronary heart disease risk calculator scores table from week two data recording form. So copy and paste that on in. Why might each of the risk calculators provide you with differing information? So hint here, think about the information used to calculate. All three of them have some similar information that they use, but they do differ in a few things. Framingham ones are pretty close, yeah, but they are different in terms of what is there. So you're going to have to take a look and write what is different between these risk calculators. What information is not included is included in one, but not the other two, or the other one, so to speak. So just write about that. Again, a couple sentences, not too much. Then, lastly, what information is missing from all three calculators? That would affect the calculated value and its validity. 
So think about the major risk factors for coronary heart disease. Um, um, I'll give you a hint right now. You should probably talk about physical activity because that is not measured or not used in the measurement of or calculation of these coronary heart disease risk calculators. So that's a hint that you should at least at a minimum mention physical activity not being included. So make sure you do that in a sentence or two. Part eight, complete the ACSM pre-participation screening algorithms. Here's the hint where it is. Um, on, your, on yourself and report if you currently participate in exercise, whether medical clearance is recommended prior to participation, um, do you have any sort of um, signs, symptoms of, I think it was, if I remember correct, it was cardiovascular, pulmonary, or renal type diseases, and the initial, uh, appropriate initial exercise intensity. So you're just following that thing on down and write, you can write it as a long sentence, uh, because I currently participate in exercise, I don't currently need break, uh, sorry, sorry uh, recommendation um, for I'm not uh, needing clearance or recommended clearance before participation in exercise. I have no signs symptoms of renal disease or cardiovascular or pulmonary disease, and so my initial appropriate initial exercise intensity is moderate exercise intensity, something to that effect. All right, so at this point, um, up until the last week before the, the lab report one is due, we haven't posted yet for this class the group data, and it might not be posted for you just yet. It, if it is, it would be right here. So up until this point, you can answer all up through question eight. Number nine, though, and all its sub-questions requires the group data. So using that, Part A of 9A, what is the average number of phone app steps per day for all the students in this course? So you'll just calculate that using the average or mean, whatever you want to call it, um, but you can use the Excel or Google Sheets to do that easily enough. And then does the class average meet the recommendations for steps per day? Recommendations are again based on that range right here. It's the same one used for six, uh, B6. So does it meet it? Is it within it or does it even exceed the top of the range? And then lastly, how do you compare to the class average? You'll just state, because my number is this, I am below, I'm at the same level or above the class average. So something to that effect. Again, just a sentence, that's it. Part B, calculate the and report the correlation coefficient for IPAC scores and phone app data. That's going to be the steps per day. So report that, calculate, uh, sorry, state specifically what this correlation means. So stating specifically what the correlation means. So definition, def definition of correlation people use typically is, oh, okay, because it's positive, as one goes up, the other goes up, or, or something to that effect. That's statistical sense, yes, but what are these measurements? These are some measures of physical activity. So uh, if they're both positive, and I'm telling you that they should be, as IPAC scores increase, or IPAC measured by the IPAC, uh, sorry, physical activity measured by the IPAC increases, physical activity measured by the phone app also increases if it was positive. It should be, by, by the way. Um, if it's not, then that's really bad. <laughs> there's, there's some screwy data in there. And we do have a video on how to do these calculations uh, in Excel right here that you can open up at some point as well. And then also state what the expected direction of this correlation is as well. Part C, calculate correlation coefficients to relate physical activity, phone app and IPAC, with blood measures total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and glucose. So this is going to be phone app to total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, glucose. That's five there, and then another five for the IPAC. So that's going to be 10 correlations overall. Make sure you highlight the whole column. Don't just leave it off at a few, mixing some things up. You can get some weird values that may give you an NA or something like that. So make sure you do the whole column top to bottom. And presented as a table. This, this, so this is your, you 
have to make a table for this. It's not that hard, but just make sure you do make a table. If you need, have any questions about how to do that, of course, please come to our office hours or contact us. So state specifically what this correlation means. Are any of them strong? Same thing as you did in Part C. Again, physical activity, a measure of physical activity, measure of blood cholesterol, measure of blood cholesterol, measure of blood cholesterol, blood cholesterol, and blood glucose. And then what is the expected direction of each of these correlations? So again, this is not what the data is, not what our data is. This is what is expected, what it should be. State each of them. It's going to be 10, 10 statements, more or less. Or you can, you can concatenate that if you'd like, but make sure you do state all of them. And then part C, does the data match? Does our class data match those expectations? And there's usually a few things that are a little wonky, just to let you know. So if not, what are some reasons for that? Could be because some people misreported some physical activity data, or they could have mis, um, or they could have not been fasting during the during the blood glu uh, during the blood glucose slash blood lipid trial, uh, things like that. But mention those; those are important. And then, is there any disagreement between the direction on the same blood measure between IPAC and Phonap? If so, state all of them. So this is asking you to take a look at total cholesterol and how it's correlated with, say, Phonap and IPAC, do they have the same direction? Like, if one's positive, is the other positive? And if not, state state that it's not, you know, that there's a discrepancy there. Or it could be LDL differs between both of them, or HDL. Make sure you take a look at all those. You could have up to five if they all disagreed. Um, but, yeah, you can get some weird stuff and we want you to take a look at that to see if there any, is anything weird like that. And then lastly, D, calculate correlation coefficients between systolic blood pressure, resting 1 kilopond, 1.5 kilopond, and recovery conditions, so that's four conditions, and physical activity level, IPAC, phone, and phone app. So that's going to be eight total correlations there and present as a table. Then you do the exact same sort of stuff here as you did above. I'm not going to go into that again because I just went into it. So make sure you turn this in by the, by the deadline. Um, otherwise, uh, please let us know if there is any questions and uh, by contacting us via email or, con or coming to our office hours. Uh, otherwise, good luck.